The Principle of Sufficient Reason Arguments for and against Our everyday experience leads us to believe, by way of common sense, that there are explanations for the existence of things we encounter. Whether it's a tornado, a ferret, or our great-uncle Doug's beard, we always assume these things and the other things we encounter have an explanation for their existence. We never assume that any event, any object, or any attribute of an object is simply a brute fact devoid of any explanation whatsoever. We assume that the things we encounter have an explanation for their existence all the time. Has not everybody made use of this principle upon a thousand occasions? asked the great rationalist philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. This universal assumption that things have explanations is called the principle of sufficient reason, or PSR for short, and is more formally stated in the following way. Whatever exists has a sufficient reason for existing. Now, is this a new idea? Well, not at all, it turns out. In fact, the PSR stretches all the way back to Parmenides and his fellow Greek philosophers of the ancient world. As it says in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the PSR is nearly as old as philosophy itself. But obviously not everything believed by the ancient Greeks, and not everything believed even by such geniuses as Plato and Aristotle has proven to be true over the course of time. This might lead us to wonder then, do we have reasonable grounds to accept the PSR? In light of this important question, let's consider some arguments for and against the PSR and see if we can move closer to an answer. First, the arguments for the principle of sufficient reason. Our first argument goes like this. If the PSR was false, we would expect common experience to be very different. If the PSR were not true, if some things have no explanation whatsoever for their existing and are simply brute facts, then we would expect to find an abundance of things wholly disconnected from any causal order. We would expect the world of our experience to be much more unintelligible than it is. But common experience, whether we're talking about the common experience of kids or the common experience of chemists, tends to be something very different. Indeed, when we're willing to expend the necessary time and energy, explanations are easy to come by for many things we ordinarily encounter. And even when we're not willing to exert the time and energy, we still assume that an explanation exists out there, albeit out of our grasp for the time being. Philosopher Alexander Pruss, a contemporary proponent of this argument, asks why things like bricks and photons don't just show up in the air ex nihilo, or from nothing. He concludes that the best explanation of this fact is that they simply cannot do that, absent some cause. Now let's move on to a second argument for the PSR. The second argument goes like this. If the PSR was false, basic assumptions of scientists would be undermined. Scientific inquiry assumes that the universe is thoroughly intelligible. While mysterious things or events might be momentarily shelved and deemed not intelligible yet, nothing ever gets sloughed off by scientists as simply and essentially and permanently unintelligible. But if the PSR is false, then we have little basis to assume the intelligibility of the universe. Furthermore, the scientific method also assumes that our perception of the external world is, in fact, accurate. When scientists study Jupiter, for example, they really believe that they're investigating a real planet that exists external to them. But as Robert Coons has argued, if the PSR is not true, then it may be true that there are no prior causes to our perceptual states. Perhaps there's no reason for the perceptions we experience. Perhaps all of our states of mind are causeless illusions. Which leads us to a third argument for the PSR. Our third argument in favor of the PSR goes like this. If the PSR was false, our cognitive faculties would be unreliable. If there were no assurance of explanations for things, 
we would have insufficient reason to trust our thoughts. If neurons may fire inexplicably, say, then why should we have any confidence in our intellect? As the Thomistic philosopher Edward Fazer has argued, we suppose that our cognitive faculties track truth and standards of rational argumentation, rather than leading us to embrace conclusions in a way that has no connection to truth or logic. But if the PSR is false, we could have no reason for thinking that any of this is really the case. To reject the principle of sufficient reason is to undermine the possibility of any rational inquiry. But this means that anyone who argued against the PSR would, if they're correct, be arguing with untrustworthy cognitive faculties. So an argument against the PSR, it would seem, ultimately invalidates its own trustworthiness. Only if the PSR is true, that is to say, only if we believe that everything, including neurons, synapses, and the thoughts in our mind, have explanations for their existence, do we really have solid grounds to believe anything we argue for. If reason has any validity whatsoever, then, it would seem that the PSR must be true. As philosopher Richard Taylor has put it, indeed, it is hard to see how one could even make an argument for it without already assuming it. For this reason, it might properly be called a presupposition of reason itself. There is, in other words, no non-circular way to argue for the PSR, just as there is no non-circular way to argue for the objectivity of the world external to ourselves, say, or no way to argue for the validity of inductive reasoning without appealing to induction itself. The truth of these things must be presupposed, then, by the very people who argue for them. These are basic universal assumptions, and they're reasonable to hold, Philosopher Alvin Plantinga calls them properly basic beliefs. Okay, so there are three common arguments for the PSR. But now let's look at three arguments against the principle of sufficient reason. The 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume argued that we're justified to hold that things may exist without a cause, that is to say, may exist without sufficient reason, because we can imagine something like a coffee cup, say, suddenly popping into existence from nothing. He thought that because we can imagine something apart from any apparent cause, that it follows that something can indeed exist without a cause at all. Although this has traditionally been held to be an argument against the causal principle, which states that whatever begins to exist must have an efficient cause, it has been invoked also as an argument against the PSR. For if we can imagine an inexplicable brute fact, proponents claim, then brute facts are logically possible. Now let's look at a second and even more interesting objection to the PSR, which has been offered by analytic philosopher Peter Van Inwagen. His reductio ad absurdum argument might be summarized in the following way. Let P be the conjunction of all contingent truths. If P has an explanation, say Q, then Q will itself be a contingent truth, and hence a conjunct of P. But then Q will end up explaining itself, which is absurd. The idea here is that all contingent truths, truths that did not have to be, form one big truth or proposition. Since all components of this big proposition are contingent, the big proposition itself must be contingent. Further, a contingent proposition can only be explained by a contingent proposition. It could never be explained by a necessary proposition. So, the explanation of the big proposition is itself contingent. But this would mean that the big contingent proposition, which consists of all contingent propositions, would both include and exclude its explanation. That is to say, it would follow that the explanation of the big contingent proposition would and would not explain itself by virtue of the fact that it is and is not included in the big proposition it's explaining. And clearly this is absurd. Therefore, the PSR is false. Finally, let's move to our third and final objection to the PSR. This is the objection from quantum mechanics. 
One of the most famous ideas in modern physics is the uncertainty principle, first proposed by theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg in the 1920s. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that due to the paradoxical behavior of physical particles at the smallest levels of reality, we can't measure the position and the momentum of a particle all at once with precision. Nature's apparent fuzziness at the quantum level has compelled some to argue then that quantum mechanical events therefore lack sufficient explanations. This argument might be stated in the following way. 1. Every effect at the quantum level occurs by chance. 2. But a chance effect cannot be explained sufficiently. 3. Therefore, the PSR does not hold at the quantum level. So there's six arguments for your consideration, three for the PSR and three against. We don't have time in this presentation to critique these arguments at any depth, but we might consider whether the PSR seems at least prima facie valid given our brief consideration of these six arguments. Now, the arguments for the PSR, if correct, would confirm our common experience, first of all. But they would also confirm the apparent intelligibility of the universe. They would confirm our rationale for using the scientific method. And finally, perhaps most fundamentally, they would confirm the reliability of our cognitive faculties. But on the other hand, if any of the arguments against the PSR turn out to be robust defeaters of the commonly held PSR, and if the undermining of the PSR means the undermining of our cognitive faculties, then we'll be left with no good reason in the end to trust our defeaters of the PSR in the first place. But this is, of course, absurd. To welcome the defeat of the PSR, therefore, would be to welcome intolerable absurdities into reality. To lose the PSR would quite literally mean to lose our minds. Therefore, it seems that the great 20th century Thomistic philosopher Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange was correct when he concluded that though the PSR cannot be directly demonstrated, it can be indirectly demonstrated by the indirect method of proof known as reductio ad absurdum. And it would also seem, in the end, that just like Parmenides and the ancient Greek philosophers found, just like Avicenna and the Arabics found, just like St. Thomas Aquinas and the Scholastics, Leibniz, Spinoza and the Rationalists, and many contemporary philosophers today have found that whatever exists has a sufficient reason for existing.